Thanks for staying with us. You're welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. A former governor of Kogi State, Yaya Belu, who is still on the run from the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission over an alleged laundering of more than 80 billion naira while in office, was this week reported to have paid in excess of $800,000 in school fees for his children at an expatriate school in Abuja. It has been more than one week since the former governor was spirited away from his Abuja home by staunch loyalist and current Kogi State Chief Executive Usman Ududu, following a siege by the EFCC operatives who had been mandated to arrest him. Since then, there seems to have been some form of communication between the law and the fleeing former governor, with this week's public admission by the anti-graft agency that it, it reached out to the former governor with certain concessions as it tried to convince him to give in. Interestingly, a court in Lokoja, the Kogi State capital, on Thursday ordered EFCC chairman Ola Olukoyede to show cause why he cannot be committed to prison for allegedly disobeying a subsisting court order. Joining us now to look at this current development in the unfolding story is Ewa Okpo, a lawyer who joins us now from Port Harcourt River State. Good morning, Mr. Okpo. Good to have you join us on the morning show today. Yeah, very good morning to you. Very good morning to you. Thank you indeed. All right. Um, bring us up to speed on uh, what you understand by what is going on between the EFCC and uh, former Governor Yaya Belo of Kogi State. Uh, so many issues going on. Uh, it's still being declared wanted. But a lot of people, including uh, chieftains of the APC, are saying that by the conduct of the chairman of the EFCC, uh, Mr. Lukoide, that it looks more like a vendetta, uh, uh, more like a vendetta than, you know, actually trying to prosecute uh, an allegation. What are your thoughts and where do you think we are on this very interesting development between the EFCC and Yaya Belo? I think that uh, it is a rather unfortunate narrative for Nigeria. And to summarize the whole of this drama, in legal terms, would be to just say, look, this is abuse of court process. Uh, why do I say abuse of court process? Look, to successfully prosecute anybody in Nigeria, in this case, the EFC is prosecuting, there are six categories of laws that you must follow. The ground norm being the constitution, Administration of Criminal Justice Act. Then the, the law that empowers the prosecutor, in this case, EFCC Act. The law that defines the offense and the punishment, in this case, Money Laundering Act. And then the law of the court with jurisdiction. In this case, that will be the Federal High Court Act. Uh, practice that, that, uh, directive and the rest of it that, that guides proceedings at the Federal High Court. And of course, the Evidence Act and other ancillary legislations. Now, what is expected of the EFC in this instance, when you follow all of these laws put together? They ought to have, at, at first, invited the suspect in the person of uh, Mr. Yaya Bello, when he refuses to honor the invite, EFC does not even need to get a warrant from the court. It is an administrative power to issue a warrant. If you cannot execute the warrant, or provided that you have done sufficient, uh, what do you call it, investigation, you file an information in the court and cause the information to be served on the suspect. At this level, it is not the EFCC that will do that. I think by virtue of Section 389 of Admission of Criminal Justice Act, it is the court officer, the sheriff or bailiff that will do that. The reason being that it could be that the suspect, Mr. Yabelo, is evading arrest or being served. It could be that EFC is not even telling the truth. So the court will now step in and attempt to serve him, the information will be attached to an order where the court officer fails, cannot effect that service. 
He comes back to court. He feels there's a form they call affidavit of non-service. He feels it. At that point, the court can now issue an order of substituted service of the information. That is when all the TV stations, the radio stations, newspapers, in fact, they can decide to post the charge on all the buildings in Kogi State and Abuja. You see how simple this is. This is the step the EFC ought to have taken. And within two months, they would have you know, gotten to this. But sadly, you know, uh, they rather attempted to arrest the man when they could not arrest him. Being smart, I, I must give it to Yahabelo, he got his lawyers and they ran to the court and got an order restraining the EFCC. Now, you must understand because I think that what the EFC are trying to do is what can be described as trial by mischief. The order restraining the EFCC does not restrain the Federal High Court. It restrains the EFC from harassing, arresting, and persecuting, not prosecuting. And that order by the learned trial judge left a window for the Federal High Court stating that, look, this is done without prejudice to your power and jurisdiction to take necessary, to give necessary orders regarding this matter. Now, when that order was issued, everybody knows EFC ought to either vacate that order, appeal it. They did appeal it. Rather, they approached the Federal High Court and obtained another order, a conflicting order. Now, this is where I'm surprised. By the practice direction of the Federal High Court, you cannot file any matter at the Federal High Court where there is a sister matter in another court. In fact, you are required to depose to an affidavit stating that there is no related matter before you file it. And so if the EFC approached the Federal High Court... Sorry, I, I have and, a question. And, I, and filed... Yes. I, I have a question. So because yes, I'm with you. Yes, so in the High Court judgment from Kogi State, I believe it says that the Kogi State High Court directed the EFCC to bring before the said Federal High Court or any such appropriate court such criminal charge, allegation, or complaint in respect of whereof the applicant is reasonably believed to the respondent to have committed any offense. So, as you said, they did leave a window open. The judgment from Kogi State High Court left a window open yes. for the EFCC to approach the Federal High Court, which they did then do in Abuja. So they did do that within even the judgment, the legal judgment. No, that is not what they did. Instead of them approaching the court, what they ought to have done would have been to approach the Federal High Court, file an information, inform the Federal High Court that there is an information, and then the Federal High Court, portion to Section 389, will now be the one to effect the service of that information or Mr. Yayabelo. Rather, the EFC went to seek, obtain an order, a warrant rather, to arrest Mr. Yayabelo. When there is a subsisting injunction restraining them from arresting and harassing the man. So maybe it's, it's you know, there's a in, in school, in English language, from secondary school, primary to school, maybe they didn't understand, they didn't lack comprehension of that order. The order was restraining them, but not the court. I've heard people say that a court cannot stop another court. That order is very simple. It did restrain the federal high court. So what the EFC ought to have done would have been to reform, draw the attention of the federal high court that, my lord, there is an information before this court. May we seek your order to, for the court to serve the court that information to be served on Mr. Yabelo. At that point, the EFC has no business going to look for Yabelo. Section 389 of Administration of Criminal Justice Act states that the registrar of the federal high court will cause the sheriff or any other officer of the court to effect that service. So at this point, they did not, you know, the reason for this is that the federal court cannot order EFC that has been restrained from arresting the Abelu to go and arrest him. To do that, the federal court has to guarantee Nigerians, has to guarantee the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, that in the course of EFC arresting him, they would not violate his rights. 
The federal court cannot do that. Okay, Mr. So, the federal court ought to have, EFC rather, ought to have asked the court to cause that information to be served on Mr. Abelou. And where the, the court officer cannot effect that service, they will not come back again and apply for substituted service. At that point, when you say that Mr. Abelou is evading arrest, it's, it's no longer, it's not an issue because there is a court order that says that you can't arrest him. Okay, Mr. Apple, let me come in no, and let's talk about you. He's this. He's being protected. Yes, Mr. Apple, let's talk about this recent court order that uh, in Lokoja that directed the EFCC chairman to show cause for allegedly disobeying a subsisting court order that we're speaking about. And it's added, of course, another layer of complexity to the situation. Now, from a legal standpoint, how significant is this development and what potential implications would it have for the ongoing investigations into uh, the former uh, Governor Yahya Bello's alleged financial misconduct just at, at this standpoint now that we're seeing this uh, recent court order from uh, Lokoja? Look, Nigerians should come together and clap their hands for that order. It is not the first time law enforcement officers in Nigeria are flouting court orders. And some of us have approached courts asking that they should be called to order. And I've sat down and I've heard a judge ask me that if I ask the commissioner of police to be arrested for disobeying this court, who will arrest the commissioner of police? A judge asked me that in court. And so it is high time we begin to let people know because, because that there's a question when you are in year one LLB, legal method, there's a, que there's a question they put to us in that, in that course. We if so cost it, if so cost it. Which says, which means, who watches the watchdog? Now the EFCC is the watchdog. We need the EFCC to function in Nigeria. But in the course of them being the watchdog, who watches them? And so when there is an order, EFC, you cannot correct wrong by doing wrong. Now, since there was an order restraining the EFC, they had no business attempting to arrest Mr. Yabelo. So, I, want to, so I just want to follow up on something. They committed contempt of court. I just want to follow up on something because, you know, the Attorney General of the Federation has stepped in and spoken, um, saying that there is no doubt that EFCC is given power by the law to invite any person of interest, even, con even considering this... Um, this sub order from Lokoja, but also because you, you did speak to the comprehension of, of the lawyers um, before, but in the IGP versus UBA, um, the, there is a judgment saying that if there is an evidence of an infringement of any fundamental right of the applicant, the situation can be remedied, but not by stopping the police investigation. Because you said earlier that the, the federal high court would have to make sure that his fundamental rights have not been infringed upon. But however, we, we have judgments from the past. We, we have law on record saying that, yes, you, you, we must make sure that there is no infringement of the fundamental rights of an applicant. However, that this should not be able to stop the investigation. Therefore, the EFCC should be allowed to invite, um, invite your higher bill. So are you disagreeing with the Attorney General of the Federation? The question to ask the Attorney General is that what is the punishment for a person refusing to obey a police invitation? Is there a law that punishes me if I'm invited? There's, is there a punishment for it? We should leave sentiment aside. If I have reason, the same way you have reasonable suspicion that I have committed an offense, I'm also entitled to have reasonable suspicion that you are about to violate my rights because I am not supposed to help you to do your investigation. There is, you know, even in America, you have law against self-indictment. I am not supposed to come and help you to investigate me. So if you want to invite me to come and answer questions, what is the guarantee I, that you are giving to me that in the course of me coming to answer those questions, you will not violate my rights? Bearing in mind that you have record of violating people's rights with sufficient evidence, Bear in mind that I have already had reasons to suspect you. Don't forget in one of the charges, you know, uh, the, the offense that Mr. Yabelo is being accused of seems to have been committed before he was even sworn in as a governor. Now, they are saying that that may have been a mistake. But a reasonable man would suspect that to be mischievous. So already you have shown me... Now, don't forget also that the EFC has been going to court before now in this matter, 
you know, to see how they could recover this said money from the school. So there are other lit litigations before now, which has given Mr. Yabelo reasonable ground to suspect that he is not being about to be prosecuted, but he is about to be persecuted. And so nobody said he should not investigate. They should go about with their investigation. And when you have gathered enough evidence, a probable cause, file an information, I must not give you, I must not come to your office to tell you what you used to indict me. I am entitled, in fact, the Administration of Criminal Justice uh, Act it recognizes the right of a citizen to keep quiet in the police uh, station. So what are we saying? All right, uh, Mr. Waikou, we want to thank you for the joining us. Yeah. I'm afraid that's where we have to leave it for now. It's a developing story, and of course, you know, we'll keep monitoring uh, all the development, and we appreciate all the insights that you have brought into the discussion today. We thank you so much indeed.